Thank you very much, Dennis, and thank you all for coming on this lovely summer afternoon. Our speaker tonight is Preston Phillips, the noted Bridgehampton-based architect. His topic is Hamterbia in the Age of Escalade Entitlement. A little background on why we're doing this. East Hampton Library launched this lecture series last year and likes to focus one lecture a year on the topic of the local built environment. Last August, we started with Paul Goldberger revisiting his seminal 1983 New York Times article, The Strangling of a Resort. Tonight, Preston will take a look at the state of affairs here today, architecturally and socially. His talk comes from a pair of articles he wrote and published last August in the East Hampton, Southampton Press. The overall picture he'll paint will not necessarily be pretty. Preston was born and raised in Gadsden, Alabama. His high school guidance counselor suggested that he go into architecture, and he's shortly enrolled in Auburn University's architecture program. He moved to New York in 1974 and landed a job with the celebrated modern architect Paul Rudolph. In 1977, Preston launched his own New York City practice, and in 1984, he moved that practice to Bridgehampton, where it is today. His most noted local project, the famous Butterfly House, was on East Hampton's Two Mile Hollow Beach and was sat right on the parking lot for many years, and it was one of the most photographed buildings uh, in our lifetimes. Please join me in welcoming Preston Phillips. Thank you, Chip. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm delighted to be at the East Hampton Library and to participate in this noted series. I arrived about a half hour ago, so I was unable to check the parking lot to see if there were any Escalades out there. <laughs> I'm just checking, as the title of my talk might have been interpreted to encourage Escalade drivers to attend as sort of a refresher course and uh, to expand their driving experience. It's a large lot, but only big enough for a half dozen or so Escalades. I should also make it clear at the outset that I've never ridden in an Escalade, nor do I know anyone who drives one. <laughs> Obviously, I refer to them only in good fun and in a metaphoric sense. I'm relatively certain that as soon as one signs the Escalade lease agreement, however, one is presented with a certificate of entitlement, which gives the driver all manner of special privileges, the most important of which is the entitlement to make a U-turn across any number of lanes of traffic and double yellow lines <laughs> to snag that parking space on the opposite side of the street. Now, if it's a diagonal parking space, the story largely stops there. But if it's a parallel spot, then the saga is only beginning, as there is almost no way to park an Escalade between two parked cars. <laughs> Try as they may, while holding up traffic behind them, they usually give up and divert to a nearby fire zone or no parking zone, or any available curb space, such as a crosswalk, where they can idle and sit comfortably while their passengers pile out to get their Starbucks fix. If you see an Escalade in, say, the Bridgehampton Commons or Citarella's parking lots, it is completely understood and universally recognized that the Escalade is entitled to two spots. Sort of a swoop in and swoop out maneuver, which cannot be accomplished in a standard 10 foot by 18 foot parking, lot, par parking space. This extra room also helps with entering and exiting the vehicle. Have you ever noticed that to get out of an Escalade, one has to hop out? <laughs> Regardless of one's size, there's a definite protocol to exiting unless, like Madonna, there are a couple of bodyguards to assist you. There must be a short instructional video for new drivers as they all seem to have the same basic move. Getting back in is more problematic unless there's a rock climbing wall at home or at the gym to practice on, as there's nothing elegant about it. Ignoring stop signs, particularly four-way stop signs, appears to be another entitlement, as slowing down appears to be the only requirement for drivers, and particularly those from New Jersey, where clearly four-way stops do not exist. The good news is after experiencing this a few times, other drivers understand up front that they have no intention of stopping. Of course, the East Hampton Airport looks like an Escalade sales lot on Thursday and Friday <laughs> afternoons. What else could one ride in after strafing across the East End, creating havoc for the citizenry below? So what, you may ask, does all of this have to do with Hampturbia? As was noted in Chip's very fine introduction. 
Um, I write an occasional column on architecture for the Southampton and East Hampton Press. According to Google, the first use of the word Hampturbia occurred in my year-end column in those papers on December 24th, 2014, wherein I wrote, I am pressed to think of another 12-month period where so much has happened on the East End as related to architecture, quality of life issues, zoning battles, assaults on local village character, and a general sense among the year-rounders that the East End is slowly becoming Hampturbia. And that was six months before uh, last month's Montauk debacle. Inventing a word is not something one should take lightly, and as such, I felt compelled to define it. My maternal grandmother's Webster's Collegiate Dictionary from 1940, which I inherited, and to which I refer frequently, defines suburbia as a blending of rural and urban. How succinct. It's a bit no more nuanced out here on the South Fork, so here goes. Hampturbia, the evolution of Long Island's East End, also known as the South Fork, also known as the Hamptons, long known for its bucolic charm, unique environment, distinctive historic villages and hamlets, and replete with farmers, baymen, fishermen, artists, rioters, captains of industry and socialites, all coexisting without social barriers into one homogeneous, overcrowded enclave of suburban sameness and exclusivity. There you have it. Having moved to Bridgehampton from Manhattan in 1984, I have seen firsthand the steady erosion of what made the South Fork so very special. I was asked in 1989 to write a piece on architecture for the Parish Art Museum's Summer Party Journal, in which I described the primary East End villages of Southampton, Bridgehampton, Sag Harbor, East Hampton, and Montauk, as a string of pearls, each different in size and luster, and each contributing equally to the strand. Not so today as a sense of sameness has descended, along with an unrelenting scourge of aircraft of every description, traffic congestion beyond anyone's concept of a bucolic existence, and the general feeling among locals and second homeowners alike that the long-held concepts of fairness, politeness, largesse, noblesse oblige, have given away to arrogance, personal gain, at the expense of others. A quick perusal of each of the front pages of our local papers in concert with the weekly editorials and letters to the editors provides a tutorial on the many issues currently at play. If one views Hampturbia as an illness, what symptoms might be evident for evaluation and eventual prognosis? Here are a few to ponder. Congestion. Overcrowding and lack of vision in local governments at all levels to stem the tide of development, both residential and commercial in nature, has reached the tipping point. The corridor of Highway 27 is a textbook example of decades of lack of political will and lack of vision. Wainscot recently discovered firsthand how a simple process such as a site plan review can go terribly wrong with its new home goods megastore, and Bridgehampton has at least temporarily dodged a bullet in the decision by CVS not to occupy the historic epicenter of its hamlet at arguably the worst intersection in the East End. Residential developments along sleepy farm roads and village lanes seemingly sprout up overnight with cookie cutter homes cheek by jowl with nary a distinctive architectural feature among them. From a distance, these developments look like one big house as the roofs merge together with little or no mature landscaping to separate them. Traffic. East-West traffic is for all practical purposes at gridlock levels, and this includes back roads in addition to the primary artery of 27, with each traffic signal or stop sign creating many mile backups. Depending on the time of day, one can expect to sit in traffic regardless of the day of the week or location. Additional development brings additional traffic in the form of construction vehicles of every size and shape, as well as deliveries, service and maintenance calls, landscapers with their tandem trailers, trash collection, or pool companies. All a far cry from the farm equipment most back roads were built to handle. Computer, co commuter bus lines and horse trailers further complicate these fragile confluences of country lanes across the once bucolic landscape. Infrastructure. 
Well, there really isn't much infrastructure to talk about, except we can't accommodate the seasonal population explosion. Be it parking or lack of same, police or ambulance service, or the much needed traffic control in our village centers, all are stretched to the limit. And with all due respect to the young adults employed by Sag Harbor and the traffic control teams in the other villages and hamlets, entitled drivers either simply ignore the well-established and posters regulations or run roughshod over them. After all, what is the $75 fine to someone driving a $250,000 car? Forget traffic control. Just protecting pedestrians in the crosswalks has become a full-time full exercise in all of our villages. Cell service is spotty and, and undependable, and the much maligned electrical grid appears to be miraculously holding up despite the unsi unsightly and tangled mass of overhead wires one would expect to find in a third world country. As to our roads, be they primary, secondary, or maintained by the state, county, or, or town, they remain under duress from the onslaught of heavy traffic. And I refer to weight here, not just the volume. Village character. Throughout the East End, village character is under assault from developers, builders, and private homeowners alike through demolition and rebuilding of homes completely out of scale for the neighborhoods in which they uncomfortably reside. Not even century-old trees are immune to the concepts of bigger, wider, and higher, as can be evidenced throughout our villages where stately trees once ruled. The concept of a blank slate on which to build is the new normal regardless of heritage or provenance. PSEG's recent callous and unapologetic desecration of East Hampton Village is another example of Aravist. In this case, a public utility from New Jersey not understanding the virtues that make this area unique. Quality of life. Who would have ever thought that, the qual that quality of life could ever be under assault in the bucolic Hamptons? Not me 33 years ago, and most likely none of the real old timers whose families have lived here for generations. How and why would anyone want to alter and threaten the very reasons one comes here to begin with? But here we are with a deluge of offensive behavior, be it on the roads, in the air above us, in the restaurants and shops, on the beaches, or on a neighboring prop property. Residents from diverse locales such as North Sea, Noyak, North Haven, Shelter Island, Sag Harbor, Bridgehampton, Sagaponic, East Hampton, and Wainscot have found common cause in the assault on one's senses and right to privacy, which is the boorish, reckless and insouciant behavior of commuter helicopter operators which use East Hampton Airport as a cash cow. Noise in its many forms rightly remains a hot topic at town and village board meetings and CAC meetings throughout the South Fork and now the North Fork. Environmental degradation. This is front page news in most of the papers last week in this. It is no no exaggeration to say that environmental damage, loss of native habitats, introduction of invasive plant species, and misuse of precious water resources caused by rapid and largely unchecked development is at an all-time high. Numerous bird species have completely disappeared and others are stressed to find adequate habitat even in many of our protected woodland and wetland areas. Drive through any area where farms still exist and enter the new paradigm in holding the marauding herds of deer away, eight foot high enclo wire enclosures to protect crops, landscape materials, flower farms, and orchards. With the automobile as the only predator of deer, and with their habitat greatly diminished, this appears the only way to salvage one's investment in agriculture. And these internment style enclosures stretch for miles through the once open farm, farms and fields of Watermill and Bridgehampton. And all those acres of lush green carpets of manicured lawns don't get that way naturally. Yes, the land is rich and perfect for growing crops, but these lawns require fertilizers as well as weed and insect control, all of which eventually filters through the layers of soil and sand to the aquifer or runs off into nearby waterways, ponds, and streams. And those lawns require water, lots of water, to maintain their lush and verdant texture. Invasive species of plants are choking our ponds and estuaries and overwhelming the natural vegetation of undeveloped and often town-owned protected properties. 
Many open vistas in our communal landscape are under threat from those who would annex protected agricultural reserves and block the visual enjoyment of same by the general public, resulting in a land grab by any estimation. Is it all simply too much? As we witnessed of late in the national scene, the fabric of society is very thin to begin with, and coupled with the enormous cost of living on these beautiful shores, it is no wonder that an us versus them mentality is taking hold throughout the South Fork. When this happens, the goodwill established for generations between the local year-round population, second homeowners, and seasonal visitors is frayed. Not a recipe for continued success or resolution by any stretch of one's imagination. So what is the answer? Having defined and outlined the symptoms of hamturbia, the task before us is to establish protocols for treating it as an illness. Like many illnesses, these symptoms may be managed in an effort to stop the progression as opposed to an all-out cure. This requires a team effort of not only our elected, elected officials, but also business interests, public entities, and the general population. The medicine may be hard to swallow in some cases, and as the recent community outrage in Montauk has proved, solutions are available to those interested in the common good as opposed to promoting self-interest and the bottom line. I have observed many changes over my three decades as a permanent East End resident, but nothing compared to the last five years. As an architect who seeks unique solutions for my clients, turning my attention to the many problems facing the Hamptons has been daunting but options do exist, at least as a starting point. Last year's East Hampton Library event with Paul Goldberger on this same stage underscored the urgency of the matters before us and revisited his landmark 1983 New York Times article entitled, The Strangling of a Resort. How prescient of Mr. Goldberger. The timing of the original article coincided with my move to Bridgehampton, so I find it particularly cogent low these 33 years hence. Clearly, the strangulation continues today and is exacerbated by those symptoms of congestion, inadequate infrastructure, assault on vill village character, quality of life deterioration, and environmental de degradation. No one prescription is available to, to address all at once, and to continue the medical analogy, some symptoms are more advanced than others. So treating them individually looks to be the best approach. Congestion. Regrettably, this is the most entrenched problem, as many decades of runaway development and lack of political will to stem the tide of, of same is a chronic problem regardless of township or the political affiliation of the governing boards. Even in the face of withering community opposition, town governments through the decades have sided with developers over citizen groups time and time again. Gratefully, we are seeing a sea change in direction in both the Southampton and East Hampton town boards and also throughout our village boards where this issue is center stage. Let us hope this trend continues. Traffic, a recent minor accident at, five of, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon at the intersection of Scuttle Hole Road and Cooks Lane and Watermill showcased the problems associated with the few true east-west arteries available to drivers. The backup was over three miles into Bridgehampton for those drivers taking the back roads to avoid sitting in traffic on 27 onto which they were eventually diverted. Heaven knows what horror show played out there as a, as a result, and there are similar occurrences weekly and in some cases daily throughout the East End. As noted earlier, given that fewer and fewer drivers acknowledge or understand how to negotiate a four-way stop, it's time to give the construction of additional roundabouts a serious look. Numerous major intersections along 27, including the one across from this library, and scores of smaller ones along the back roads would benefit immeasurably for, from such a bold undertaking. The woefully undersized roundabout at Scuttle Hole Road and Mitchell Lane in Bridgehampton notwithstanding, these installations have proved invaluable traffic flow tools. A harder pill to swallow, however, is to limit truck size, weight, and length in our village centers where local governance of the roads can override the county and state. There are just too many huge, heavy, and unwieldy vehicles choking the lanes of our villages. 
the street patterns of which largely date from the 1800s. I include in this limitation the tandem trailers pulled by dump trucks and used by landscape companies throughout the South Fork. Parking along narrow lanes and on roadside shoulders for these and other service vehicles is dangerous and distracting to the motorist. The weight of vehicles is another matter as our roads are simply not constructed to handle the weight being applied to them as the constant damage associated with recent winters clearly attests. Have you seen some of the heavy equipment being transported through our village centers? I'm not sure where they're headed and what these vehicles are moving, but it's clearly a monumental task. Weight limits on our village streets and lanes should be enacted. Infrastructure. Given that our collective infrastructure is an uncoordinated patchwork of numerous public and private entities, it is difficult to provide any concentrated solution. However, that is not to say that there are no available solutions, particularly as related to the visual environment. Out of control and often redundant highway signage is plaguing our villages and hamlets, Bridge Hampton in particular. Remove all but the essential signage for public safety and parking restrictions. The tangled mess of overhead wiring along our few remaining undeveloped bucolic roadways, such as Scuttle Hole Road in Bridgehampton, is another area where the benefit of many could be achieved through the actions of a public utility. Even if only 10 miles of wires could be selectively buried throughout the East End, a great public benefit would result. In order to maintain some sense of civility and order, more police and traffic control patrols are desperately needed in the summer months in our village centers. And the aforementioned disgraceful condition of our roadways is far from the standard one would expect in such a prestigious resort destination. It's troubling year after year to see one stretch of roadway resurface only to have it dug up a few months later to install some pipe or line below it, then poorly patched. There is clearly little or no coordination of efforts between public utilities and governing highway departments which is inexcusable and costly to the taxpayer. Village character. Following the lead of the South Fork's newest village, Sagaponic, all primary East End villages now have limitations in, the, in, in place to stem the steady erosion of well-established neighborhood character through limits on house size and lot coverage. Hooray. Mature trees should also be the focus of preservation as these lend shared value to an otherwise bleak landscape. Reduce speed limits and restrictions on parking in residential zones near commercial areas is also needed. Look no further than Rhizome Street in Sag Harbor is a prime example of a beautiful residential street as a parking lot. Greater influence by and attention paid to the various village and hamlet community action committees is another avenue for citizens to rally around a communal cause, such as the recent successful protests over the CVS application in Bridgehampton's historic epicenter. Quality of life. In my estimation, quality of life, or the lack of it, is the fulcrum on which the prognosis of Hamturbia turns, and there is no greater threat to it and to property values far and wide than the noise generated by the East Hampton Airport. Over the recent 4th of July weekend, it became a den above my Bridgehampton residence five and a half miles from the airport where helicopters were strafing the treetops to get in under very low ceilings, creating a danger to all in their path. Shouldn't public safety and welfare be the test of whether air traffic is diverted to another airport? I visited the airport last Sunday with helicopters hovering, waiting for space to be vacated by departing seaplanes in close proximity to the terminal. It looked like the exodus from Saigon, for those who recall that debacle. <laughs> Helicopters, seaplanes, single-engine props, and jets were parked so, so tightly as to meld into a sea of wings and tails. I continue to be an advocate for local pilots and flying enthusiasts for whom the airport was originally chartered as a gift to East Hampton. The exponential increase, however, in commercial aviation interests whose only tie to East Hampton is the airport tarmac requires serious restrictions and well-established overwater primary flight paths into East Hampton airspace. For a decade or more, the so-called Powerline route, 
above the clearly vis visible scar on the ter terrain, which are the high transmission lines running from Southampton to Montauk, was the primary arrival route. Once aircraft crosses over Rose's Grove and Watermill now and get a visual lock on the airport eight miles away, the pilots veer off this well-defined and relatively unpopulated route to make a beeline to the airport over more heavily populated swaths of terrain. Rarely do they ever maintain a 2,500 foot minimum elevation, which is the FAA mandated flight height for any and all aircraft passing above protected environmental sites such as the Long Pond Greenbelt in Bridgehampton, as well as the Morton National Wildlife Refuge in Noyak. Both sites have hundreds of flights crossing above them weekly in high season. The town of East Hampton is embroiled in a battle royale with these carpet-bagging commercial aviation interests and may have faltered early in the process when they opted for a one landing and takeoff per week rule over a weekend ban for the well-established noisy category of aircraft. It remains an open question before a federal court, but if commercial aviation interests are allowed to co-op the East Hampton Airport, the Hamptons as we have known them are finished. Other valid concerns such as weekend bans on gas-fired leaf blowers and construction on Sundays or before 7 a.m. any day are all important in a microcosmic sense and are best addressed in the various town and village boardrooms. Lastly, environmental de de degradation. The use of nitrogen-rich lawn fertilizers and weed and insect control are threats to the natural environment on a multitude of layers. Nutrient runoff from lawns and septic systems in proximity to ponds and waterways are viewed as the critical ingredients for the algae blooms in our ponds when mixed with high temperatures. A moratorium on the use of nitrogen-based lawn fertilizers within a quarter mile of bodies of water would be a good first step in preventing this dangerous and toxic condition. Other environmental threats abound, particularly the loss of habitat due to overdevelopment and in many cases overclearing where the building site is completely scraped clean. The loss is immeasurable and touches every class of mammal, amphibian, bird, fish, or insect native to these shores. From the smallest fish to the largest raptor, the connection through the food chain is frayed, and in the case of birds, many lose their nesting and food sources and just move on entirely. Whippoorwills and bobwhites are but two such species. The current regional proposal for all five East End towns to use community preservation funds to improve water quality and restore habitat is a brilliant concept at tackling this issue and will be before the voters this fall. Enforceable fines and the tens of thousands of dollars are needed to get the attention of a homeowner with deep pockets who really wants that green carpet of grass rolling down to Georgia Capon or the developer who wants a blank slate onto which to construct another swooping gambrel roof extravaganza. There have been successes, New, notably the Dark Skies Initiative, which was conceived to protect our nighttime skies from unnecessary glare and light pollution, and the popular ban on single-use plastic bags, which littered our roadways. Both issues required the expenditure of political capital for the public good and have been successfully implemented. So where does this leave us, and what prognosis can we draw from these limited solutions? An oft-published and highly respected academic authority from Great Britain, R. W. Butler, published a landmark study on tourism in 1980 and revisited the topic in 2010 in a two-part uh, book entitled The Tourism Area Life Cycle for which the Hamptons appear to be a textbook case. I will avoid citing the minutiae contained therein, but suffice to say we are at the critical tipping point of tourist capacity leading to development restrictions where a sphere of conflict exists between two distinct social groups, the entitled new moneyed class of visitors and the local inhabitants and year-rounders. This is also referred to as the period between flourishing and collapse. Sound familiar? 
Given that Mr. Butler still travels, writes, and lectures extensively, perhaps there is still time to bring in a specialist in the field to see if there is hope for survival and recovery, or if life support is our only option. Thank you for your time and attention this evening. That was just so good. The, the well, fact thank that you, you put it into words so well. We're very appreciative. And I've, I've lived here for almost seven decades myself, and I live here year-round. And uh, for the past almost two years, we've been working on a group with a group called Bury the Lines, which um, brings me to my question. We met once a week for... Um, at least six months. Now we don't meet as often because we are all rather discouraged. When you see what happened to the Amagansett Railroad Station, and when you see what happened to McGurk Street and to Town Lane, and what happens on North Main Street near the uh, IGA, mm -hmm. we are just, um, we feel helpless and we feel very discouraged. We uh, tried to appeal to the, um, to the governor's office. We tried to talk to PSE&G, which was really difficult. And, um, and now I feel the same thing is happening on a national scale. <laughs> I mean, it's um, the, the, the little guy the, 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 that doesn't have deep pockets is really... Um, helpless when it comes to fighting the big guns. So I love your points, and I feel that, that as members of the community, we have to help the town, and we have to uh, help return our, our, the beauty to our location. So that's it. Well, I appreciate your comments, and you, you need a partner to help with all of those things, whether it is I think the local governments have been very responsive, but the governor should have stepped up. This PSEG thing is a bit of a disaster. But what I have found is that you, you literally have to get almost a national story going about how terrible it is before anyone pays attention, which is tragic because what happens in East Hampton should be able to be settled in East Hampton or Sag Harbor or wherever. So it's one of those um, issues that I know I have followed your work and I've seen the bumper sti stickers and there there could be a real public service to just take a half mile here and a half mile there and two blocks there and get rid of the lines and just make the visual uh, interest of the, of the community so much more enhanced. How are you? Uh, my name's Ernie French. I live out at 1 Sammy's Beach Road, which we try to keep a secret, but it's out now. So it's, uh, and uh, I went, uh, I guess, two weeks ago to the town board <coughs> and was given my three minutes. And basically it was a complaint about the quality of life. And mostly, <coughs> I mean, there's many uh, items on that list, but the one is noise. And Construction and actually landscaping noise is allowed to take place from 7.30 in the morning till 8.30 at night. Is it 7? 7. <coughs> then I was informed by the uh, code enforcement that that's only loud noise, that uh, construction work is allowed to continue and can continue 24 hours a day as long as it does not reach a certain decibel limit. And of, and of course, if you do call code enforcement, they come out and everybody's quiet and the, you, know, you look like an idiot and you know, the, they leave. But the actual fact, and also just tying it in with the construction, that, and that's seven days a week. There is no time in my life where there is not background noise. I actually have, I'm a professional fisherman actually and an architect, so I have kind of like a, a unique look at a, a lot of this stuff that's going on. But I was a couple years down in the Caribbean on a very remote island, 
and something was odd, and the oddness was that there was no noise. <laughs> and, uh, you know, whatever can be done about the noise, because it, 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 is, a, it, it is a technique for torture, obviously, mm. in, uh, in a lot of prisons, and, you know, that endless noise just causes anxiety. And, and I, I work at home, I have an office at home, so I do sit there, and whenever I hear a truck, and you hear them far off, they're, they're coming up, I'm just afraid that it's a big backhoe that's gonna knock down a house without any notice and, and just start a construction project that will go on. I did have that actually happen on, was Labor Day the first one, or no, Memorial Day. The day before Memorial Day, the tree service came in and just 85% cleared a Clear lot yeah. in a recharge zone because it's a previous cleared lot. They can take all the, all the mature trees down that they want up to 85%, even if it is in a recharge zone for Three Mile Harbor, which you know we're uh, suffering uh, mm -hmm. a lot of... Uh, uh, pollution from. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to do a lot of clamming in Three Mile Harbor and it's getting dicey. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do it. Okay, so that's it. But if anybody wants to work on getting this place to be a quieter place, you can contact me. It's Ernie French and it's Ernie F at optonline.net and it's one Sammy's Beach Road is where I live. You can always stop by. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ernie. Ernie. Mr. Phillips, thank you very much. You really covered it all. Thank you. I knew I was going to be depressed when I came. Well, <laughs> I didn't want to be too, you know. You, you fulfilled that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one thing that you did talk about, of course, and you said that the Hamptons will be over unless we get a handle on the airport noise problem. And, and I, I know that you've been involved, and I, I am involved in Quiet Skies Coalition. For, but the town board needs to hear from residents. They think it's only a few people that complain because we have the helicopters uh, just, uh, you know, going over our rooftops. Um, how do, I, I have one suggestion. You can all come on Monday to LTV at 9.30 in the morning. The airport noise subcommittee has now been reconvened. I read that today in the paper. A, as at a citizen's advisory mm -hmm. group because the town board refused to reappoint them or keep them. So that would be very helpful if everybody showed up. But I wondered if you, you have a suggestion of how we mobilize, because this is the only, th th this is like a David and Goliath. This is all this money from an industry that doesn't even s start here, starts in New Jersey and Manhattan. It's getting bigger and bigger. You see the full page ads for Blade, Blade seaplanes now, Blade helicopters, Jet Smarter offers <laughs> helicopter rides. So. How, how do we engage the public to actually let the board know we own this airport and they control it? Well, I have been involved in this particular issue about a decade. And the helicopter situation really is of, of the last five years, six years-ish. Um, the um, number of noise complaints is over 80,000. Now, there aren't a handful of people making 80,000 phone calls. Yes, it's, since, since they started having this 1-800 number that you call or the whatever, the, they're now up to 80,000. It, it eclipses any airport in the country by 10 times. So um, I, I don't buy the thing that the, they don't understand that, that, that the public is engaged. People in South Hold are absolutely furious. People in Noyak are absolutely furious. Um, I'm not so sure that the new town board in Southampton is as up to date as they need to be based on the change of uh, Anna going and run for Congress and Bridget moving to the county legislature. But um, uh, there is, I think, enough history about this issue that there should be no doubt that this is a major, major problem. And I do think that it is the, the fulcrum on which the future of the Hamptons turn because if the quality of life is diminished to the point 
that no one you know, wants to live here, or live in an area that is so noisy or so uh, invasive in terms of what your right to privacy is being invaded. Um, there are some other issues that if the court case fails on the part of East Hampton Town, I think that could be taken up. But until it work, this particular issue works its way through the court, of course, if the town wins and the helicopter companies lose, they're going to take it to the next court and the next court and the next court. But it is the sort of thing that I think has um, a huge grassroots support. And, but I mean, how many times are you going to leave your pool and go in and make a phone call about how annoyed you are? How, you're out gardening and all of a sudden you've got somebody like coming in over your house at like, you know, 300 feet. Um, it's just, you, at some point there is a wariness that comes in to, to that. Um, so, you know, as sympathetic as I am to the lack of action, I think that there has been a tremendous amount of political capital spent, particularly by the new East Hampton Town Board. We would never have this happening if it weren't for the new board. Wouldn't it be more effective if we could also lodge a complaint by uh, uh, going to a website and instead of having to wait on hold on, on the telephone? Um, there is a website. There are there two websites website. now. You, as can, you can lodge your complaint by logging on to a website. Yes, there are two now, and I don't know them offhand. If you if you Google airport noise complaint, will you get that will you get that address? Okay. The library will get the links and we'll add them to the advertisement of this program on Bravo. the b2bseries.org website. Do I hold this? <clears throat> I want to ask you to look into your crystal ball and look ahead about 30 years and tell me what you see there uh, happening to the very, very large houses that are being built here in this area that are really destroying Amagansett and East Hampton now. And also, I've seen them in Bridgehampton, and I'm talking about the Farrell houses, of course, that have invaded our territory. I would like very much to add also my f feelings about it, which are that in 20 or 30 years, I see these places being turned into inns and hotels, if not being torn down, because right now, there are people who are willing to work in these places as domestics. There are housekeepers and so forth, gardeners, lots and lots of labor out there. But in 20 or 30 years, the, these people's children are going to college, and they're not going to be there clipping lawns and clipping hedges and taking care of bathrooms in these huge houses. These houses are going to be torn down, and God knows what will result but I see them as nursing homes. I see them as hotels. I see them as... Well, you've thought this through. I really run down you know. in. <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree? I'd like to know what you think. I think that the, I think that the maintenance on any um, uh, residents of the size you're describing w will always be a problem. It's, it'll be a problem in less than 30 years. Um, the number of windows and the number of... Um, the siding and the roofs and all those things are going to require so much maintenance and so much um, replacement and repair. Um, you, you go through some of the old estate sections and you see these fabulous old houses and they require year-round, all the time, maintenance. Because I've worked on a few of them and it's astounding what is required. And I don't think most people who are building an eight-bedroom house or a 12,000 square foot house or putting all these bells and whistles into their houses, I don't think they've, they've projected that in, in their lifetime, what, what is going to be required. And of course, the, the grounds and the, all the, the maintenance of the grounds and the pools and the, and the tennis courts and whatever. So I think it's a very valid point. I've, I've not given it a lot of thought because it's, it's not going to be a pretty sight. And what's going to happen to all those buildings, I have no idea. I wouldn't want to own one, so.
Yes, they did. Yes, they did. I'm Chuck Hitchcock. Yes, uh, Chuck, good to see you. Good to see you. I came out here in 1967 uh, to teach at the college in Southampton, and there was an article in the New York Times that by 1970 there would be uh, a electrified rail to Riverhead. Oh, we're still waiting. But it, <laughs> my question has to do with the East End Transportation Study that uh, has been done, and the suggestion being that we have light rail from Sagaponic out, and that buses meet the trains uh, where there are uh, people coming out for the day trippers, in mm -hmm. a sense, and take them, take them to the beach or wherever they're going. What are your thoughts about that? Well, are you sure it was Sagaponic? Is that where the light rail was going to take it to? I thought it was... I'm sorry, it wasn't Sagaponic, it was... Spionk, thank you. I, I didn't think that rang, rang a bell. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I think people are, in a way, so entrenched with the way they, they work and the way they... Um, they live, it would, it would, it, that's very common in Europe or in Asia, um, you, or even I think South America, you get some of that going on between big cities. But it's not the sort of thing that I think it would take a lot of a new generation to adapt to that, to not have a car, to, to get off or you know, take a bus to go someplace else and then take a bus back. Um, it's a brilliant concept and it saves a lot of the uh, unnecessary traffic that we have. I just don't know how many people above 30 or 40 would do that. That's my only thought. I'm letting Dennis rule the roost here. So. I was interested in your comments about uh, the need for all the community to get together, and you mentioned the business community. And, and it made me wonder if you have any thoughts about a resort area like this with our traditions can offer a sort of viable, sustaining um, design that would uh, make business feel that they had an adequate self-interest in the project. That, well, that they would get enough out of it to be collaborators in the kinds of changes there are um, you know there are really two two towns Southampton and East Hampton town and in both areas um, you know Southampton covers a lot of territory and a lot of diverse um, areas um, East Hampton less so and more concentrated and I looked to Montauk to see what they did in Montauk in a very short period of time because Montauk last summer a year ago today was in absolute disarray and chaos. And they got together, they worked it out, it was a partnership between citizens, business, government, and I'm not going to say it's perfect, but the difference between last year and this year is astronomical. And Montauk just kind of happened overnight. I mean, all of a sudden, people would wake up and people sleeping on their porches or in their cars or worse, you know. So um, it, I, I think from, from that, that's a good example of it worked and worked quickly. Um, and I know there's other uh, examples, but I think that's probably the best and most cogent one. So what did they do? Um, well, they passed a lot of restrictions in terms of, uh, of uh, nightclubs and parking and um, increased police presence, um, curfews on... on um, how much, how long you could play music, and wh who could play music or who couldn't play music, and um, it really became either a life or death struggle for Montauk very quickly, and I think that they were, they have been successful, and a lot of business got behind them, and um, I'm going out there on Tuesday for my first visit this year, so I'll know more then. Um, I think we've got maybe just time for a couple more, two more. Um, say we get organized and we diminish the uh, noise from the airport. What about this increasing landscape business industry and the noise it creates over nothing? A half acre lot, the mowers and blowers are going for an hour twice a week. I know in Sagaponic this is a very, very big deal and they have a small enough little area that they're really tackling this mm -hmm. issue and I think it's going to be a, a limit on time. But you can only use those blowers between A and B in terms of time. Never on Saturday, never on Sunday. Um, I'm not sure about um, the, uh, the type of blower, also the gasoline-fired blowers. 
uh, and also the hedge clippers. I was at a house over in Southampton in the estate section a week ago, and it was deafening because of the hedge clippers that they were using. And now that people are cutting down so many trees, there's all this thumb grinding that's happening too, which is uh, which is <laughs> which is all you know noise and also noise generated. Another thing is the blowers. It's not just the noise, but they blow all sorts of uh, pollution, dust. debris, dust, dust things yeah. that are very unhealthy yeah, for yeah. the environment. Yeah. Again, this should be regulated in the village and town uh, boards. It'll be interesting to see what Sagaponic does because I think they're really going to tackle this. They are tackling it. I think. I don't know if you ever read Mary Lee Foster and the. Uh, Southampton Press, the SAG scene. It's almost a, it's almost a, a monthly, she'll do some, I think if there's something in there today on noise, as a matter of fact. If you read today's SAG scene in the Southampton Press by Mary Lee Foster, it's all about noise. I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's from you that I developed this term now called escaloditis, and I think that is not confined to behavior with your car. Uh, consistent with what the lady just said about small lots, there is a new plague. We didn't experience it. We came 37 years ago. But people on their small decks now have speaker systems, and they point them all over the place. And on the holiday party weekends, it's just impossible. Well, this may be the decibel question that we heard earlier. I mean, you may have to get a decibel meter and read the amount of noise coming from your neighboring property. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, this will be the last question. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you all so much. Hi, thank you very much for your for your uh, talk. We found it very interesting. You're very welcome. As you can probably tell from my accent, uh, I'm uh, uh, an Englishman. My wife and I split our time between Cedar Street here in East Hampton and uh, and London. And I wanted to comment particularly on your um, uh, remarks about preserving trees. Um, we've recently taken down a small cottage on our plot, which we owned for about 10 years, and built a house of which I hope you would have approved. Um, but we, uh, it's quite a narrow plot, and we were confronted with an issue um, concerning a tree. And we got one of the local arborists in who told us that this maple was 125 years old. Um, and everybody was looking at the plot, was saying, take it down, just, you know, um, cut it down. Even the planning department said, cut it down. And the reason we asked the planning department was in, is in London, you would never be able to cut a tree down of that age. Um, you would have had a preservation order on it, as you suggested. Um, we were determined that we weren't going to do that, and we pulled the house that we were designing forward on the plot and have kept that, the, the tree, and it gives us a lot of pleasure Bravo. and a lot of shade. And... Um, <laughs> Thank you. And, and it, you know, it, it did seem to us that it was essential to preserve the character of the neighbourhood that we do that. And, and I think you're absolutely right to say that the, um, the local community should insist that trees of, of that age should have um, preservation orders put on them. And value. They have a lot of value. and It's a shared value with the community. Thank you all so much. It's, you know,